Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, I would like to talk about a very personal topic today, as you can guess from the title. Um, I have always, or I have in the last few weeks, gotten a lot of questions um, on TikTok, on YouTube, if I've always been so knowledgeable or sensitive to um, racism, to white supremacy, to all these topics I talk about on my social media platforms. So I thought, why not put this into a video? Well, the long, the short answer is no, I haven't. And the long answer is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, I was born and raised in Germany. Um, Germany being a predominantly white society, Germany never been a country, no white country is that acknowledges its, its past in Africa, um, its colonial past outside of Europe. Um, the past about slavery, about invasion. Um, Germany is not a country that teaches you about racism. And from my knowledge, I stand to be corrected, no white, predominantly white country is. Um, no country is going to teach you that you have privileges because of the crimes they committed in the past. That makes no sense. So me being raised and born here, you, you kind of like grow up in like a bubble, you know, that bubble only contains white people and everybody outside the bubble is like trying to pinch that bubble, letting white people know that why they are doing what they are doing is wrong and why it's wrong, where it comes from and why this does this behavior harm black people and people of color. So when I was growing up, of course, I knew what racism was. I knew that racism is a bad thing. Um, but I did believe it's something that only bad people have or think or share or practice. You know, I wasn't raised to know that racism is inherited. Um, I wasn't raised to know that racism is in all of us once you're white, because you cannot, like Jane Elliott says, you cannot be raised and socialized in a racist society and come out non-racist. That's not possible. So when we look at racism and looking at the past of Germany, um, Germany being a country that has always swept its colonial past under the rug, um, but has, on the other hand, um, owned up to their crimes committed on Jewish people, um, we were raised to know about the Holocaust. We were taught in schools superficially not it didn't go in depth you know we were raised to know about the holocaust like those places are still there they are like i wouldn't say tourist spots but they are they are still very much there for people to go and see what germany did it's a constant it's supposed to be a constant reminder of our crimes in the past um but the acknowledgement stops in the present as in it's not something that they are like okay we did this to Jewish people, and that's why our society is like this, because there's no connection, um, because the exploitation um, and the killing and the murder of Jewish people doesn't have the same economical um, weight than the exploitation of Africa has. And the, the acknowledgement of the Holocaust stops here, like okay, we've done this in the past, we are not going to do it again, we are sorry, we've paid reparations, that's our past, literally. But when it comes to the exploitation of Africa, Germany's like, oh, Africa? No. Mm, no. We literally slaughtered the, Hama, the, the Namas, the Hereros, um, we killed this entire people in Southern Africa to an extent that they almost, almost, they were completely wiped out. They were almost completely wiped out from their own soil. We kill people in today's Cameroon, in Ghana, um, in, part in, in, in parts of Northern Africa. We had hands in so many places of colonialism. We hosted the Berlin Conference in 1884, where Africa was sliced like a cake by um, European countries. But Africa, and acknowledging our past, mm, no. We will not. But why? Why are we not? So my personal theory is that if we own up to our past in Africa, we are at the same time going to be forced to make up for that, which is not possible because you cannot make up for killing millions of peoples and then continuously exploiting their descendants to an extent that the people in their own countries do not have hands of their own resources. 
you know, the the acknowledgement the acknowledgement and responsibility to the crimes we commit in Africa, which affects Europe as a whole, cannot be the same than the one we did towards the Jewish people, because from the Jewish Holocaust, we didn't pull no eco- economical power. But we do pull eco- economical power from the exploitation of the motherland. So that's a whole different story, because if we step up and be like, oh, by the way, Germany offered Namibia 10 million euro reparations. And Namibia was like, no, we are not going to take that money, which is point one, it's ridiculous. Point two, it's ridiculous. And point three... <laughs> It's ridiculous. You, I mean, how can you kill people to an extent that they are almost wiped out from the surface of the earth? And then you what? You want to apologize with 10 million euro, whereby you are already very much aware of the fact that that money is not going to get to the descendants of the people you killed. You know, because you put the system of power in place where it is to still benefit you and you only. So when we are looking at Western exploitation in Africa, it's far more than slavery and colonialism. It's neo-colonialism. It's the fact that we are still benefiting from Africa's poverty, which doesn't exist because Africa is not poor. Africa is being exploited. Africa is being robbed. Africa is being over-Westernized. Africa is being... To cut the long story short, I know some of you are going to hate me for that, but Africa's problem is the white man. That's just to say point-blank period. You know, there's no doubt about that. So when we want to acknowledge our past, we need to, at the same time, promise that we are going to do better in the future, which would then mean we need to give African trade its fairness, its payment, and its um, what it deserves, which means we cannot keep our standard because we can only keep our standard by exploiting Africa. So once we have an equal trade, which means we are making, going to make sure that from the first person to the last person until the whatever resources we are exploiting is going to be treated and paid fairly, by the time that resources get to Germany, it's no longer going to be payable for us. We can no longer afford it. Because you need to know Germany has nothing. We have no natural resources. We have no um, strong economical power on our own. What we have is we made this huge made in Germany bubble, which is like such a huge brand and it's such a huge name. But when you look at the law and the specifications and definitions of made in Germany, you find out that it's all just a fraud. Made in Germany literally only means, okay, like like this, this toy, okay? It can be made in Germany, but the fabric comes from China. Um, The filling comes from Taiwan. The eyes come from Russia. Uh, the sewing threads come from, I don't know, Japan. So all these things, we ordered it from all over the world and we only sewed, we sewed that toy here in Germany. All these things were put together as the, the final product in Germany and that's made in Germany. And that's not made in Germany because it still says it's only been fixed as the final product in Germany. That doesn't mean that the single individual parts come from Germany. It simply means it's being put together as the final product in Germany. So the quality still comes from China, from Japan, from Taiwan, from Malaysia, from wherever we get the resources from, from Congo, from Africa as a whole. You know, so even made in Germany is not made in Germany. So owning up to our past in Germany means we need to rewrite history. We need to um, pay reparations that are trillions of euro. Where are we going to get that from? You know, that's going to end our economical power in the blink of an eye. So owning up to our past and then at the same time teaching people why white people are being treated the way they are being treated in society and then correcting history that we've whitewashed also means there has to be some kind of conviction because you cannot whitewash history globally and go scot-free, but that's white privilege. You know, white privilege means, it does not mean that you cannot be poor. It doesn't mean that you cannot struggle. It simply means that your skin color is never going to be a threat. Your look is never going to be a threat to your life. It's never going to make life harder for you. And that's already privilege enough. You don't need to be rich to have it easier in life. Once you're white, even if you're poor and you're competing with the very rich um, black man 
dark-skinned black man for that matter, you are more likely going to be taken for the job, even if you're less qualified. You are more likely going to have attention when it comes to buying an expensive car, um, renting an expensive apartment, um, applying for a certain job, even though your qualification might be a lot less. You are going to be treated better simply because you're white, because the system was set up like this. This does not necessarily mean that every white person is guilty of misusing that privilege, but many of us, most of us, are in denial of that privilege. So what's denial? Denial equals guilt, because you cannot be, because if you're denying something, that means you have not read about it. You have not researched about it, because everybody in their right mind researching and reading on white privilege, if you have some little bit of common sense, you know that it's real. You know that this is why you're not going to be randomly stopped and killed by the police on the road. But a black man is more likely to. That's also why when you are a white woman and you give birth, you are not three to five times less likely to be killed or die during childbirth. And I'm saying killed because the lack of medical attention is being killed. You might die as a result of the childbirth, but you wouldn't die if you weren't white. And that's murder. Treating somebody any less because of their skin color and them then dying as a result of a childbirth, that's murder. That's not the, they are not dying a natural death. They are being killed by the medical racist system. So when you talk about all these things, we don't know those things. So then the question is, how did I come to know? Okay, when I started uh, joining social media, that was in... Um, I think 2011 or something like that, 2010, I started interacting with other women that are also in a black relationship, black and white relationship. Um, I started reading things. I started having contact with um, black people. You know, there were Facebook groups, then Facebook groups were the thing. You know, that's where you get your knowledge from, hair knowledge, whatever, skincare knowledge, makeup knowledge. That is where everything was happening then. So... Then I started reading about reverse racism. That was the first time I came across the, t the topic reverse racism. And I, I was a firm believer of the fact that we don't see color. You know, uh, we are all the same. That's why I said I was once a Karen, because I used to trivialize racism. That's the thing. I used to trivialize it. I used to deny it. Yes, I used to deny racism because... Not that I was like, oh, racism doesn't exist. I used to tr deny it and trivialize it in the fact that I would be like, oh, but if a black person hates me because I'm white, they are being racist towards me. Meanwhile, they are just discriminating me, if, if even at all, you know. And that has no social or economical power, not even in a predominantly black uh, society. Because of white privilege, if I go to a predominantly black society, I am still going to be treated better than native black people in that society, in that country because of white privilege. And everything stands and falls with colonialism and slavery because this is the system that made the system the way it is today even possible. So then I came across one woman. I'm st she's still my friend in Facebook up till today. Um, she was very angry about my comments. You know, when you interact in such groups, of course, um, social topics are being discussed. So um, I, I was always on the front line. I was this I was defending the fact that black people can be racist because Wikipedia says you can be racist when, once you hate another person for their race, right? So now I've come to realize how, is you, how are you going to oppress the oppressor, point one. Point two, how can I expect a white person or a white system to come up with the real and truthful definition of racism, which means a racism is exclusive to white people? Um, towards anybody non-white. That is literally like a confession. So the white man is not going to sit up here and give us Wikipedia and then still let us know that he is the criminal. That's not going to happen. And she did not stop telling me. And um, other black people told me too, of course. And that's also why I know you need a white person to tell another white person that we are who we are. Because which is, by the way, also racism. Um, but the thing is, we are raised to more listen to our own first. Like I said, this is racism because how can you be listening to somebody that tells you about the victim other than listening to the victim, right? Because a white person is never going to tell you how it feels to experience racism, but a black person will. So you rather listening to the white person, that's literally you are overhearing the black person simply because you cannot identify with them because they don't look like you. 
racism. So um, she, she, I don't know what she saw in me up to today. I don't know. Um, but she did not stop. She kept telling me, Nicole, you are wrong. You are wrong. You need to change. You have a child. You have a black child. You need to change. You need to change your thinking. You are going to harm your child. And she did not stop. And this went on for weeks. So um, at one point or the other, I was like, why is a white woman telling me that white people are racist? There must be something going on that I am not understanding. And then I started reading and I started re researching and I started reading about sources from black people that explained reverse racism as a part of racism to trivialize racism by the white man, right? So um, that was my clicking point, honestly. And then I started, of course, it was, it was uh, a procedure that took weeks, months, years. I'm still learning. Everybody is still learning. I am not perfect. By far, I am not perfect. I am not free from racism. I am not free from color, cultural appropriation. I am not free from discrimination. I am not free from, from oppression because socially I am always on the side of the oppressor, whether I want that or not, which always puts me in the position of being guilty on the approval and otherwise. So um, I started reading, um, I started falling into kind of like a white fragility phase where I was trying to push all these things away from me and I was like, I don't want this. I, I was like, it was like a depression, but it wasn't a real depression. It was like, I was feeling guilty. I was fighting all these inner demons. You know, I was like, how can I be this, this, you know, this social oppressor while loving a black man, while having a child with him, you know, how does all this come together it's not it's not fair I don't want this you know I was trying to push it away from me and then those things started happening my my son started experiencing racism in school I started seeing that the things my husband has been experiencing are racism I started experiencing and I, I started really experiencing firsthand what it means to be privileged solely because of the color of your skin and it made me angry it made me very angry. And I deeply believe if, if you're white and the system doesn't make you angry, you are not there yet. Because we need anger. We need to overcome the face of white fragility and white tears. I need to turn the system into anger to fight the system. Because we, I personally, I, the only way I will stop talking about this is when I'm dead. Because even today, I feel that a guilt on my shoulders so many times I like almost every day it's it's there it's very present because now I've come to to realize things sometimes even before my husband does in a way of oh my god maybe we are watching a movie and um just like currently we are watching Greenleaf on on Netflix and um one of the sons of the Greenleaf pastor or the bishop cheated on his black wife with a white woman. And um, I, I swear to God, <laughs> that time I would have never seen anything wrong with that. It was just a cheating husband. But the media is giving us an image of black men and at the same time of black women and white women that puts the white woman in a position of power, the black man in a position of a cheater, a liar, someone that is a homebreaker, and the black woman as a sensitive, fragile, breaking, submissive, weak part of the family. Because in that, I don't know who of you have watched the series, she's been told to pray for her husband, to stay with her husband, you know, for better, for worse, even though he's disrespecting her, he's not treating her well. The white woman is being like, I know you have a wife, I don't care, I just want that BC. Okay, like, I'm not going to say it because I don't want the video to be flagged. So, and the black man is like, I want to cheat on my wife. He never, they never made any reasons. He never brought race into this. But the fact that Netflix is showing such a constellation fits and feeds into the system of white supremacy. This is also why black love between a successful black man and a successful black woman, both of them being dark skinned, is barely, barely represented in the media. This, the system of white supremacy lives off the destruction of the black family. And um, that's also another reason to expand this even further, why I do not, 
want no hope or support well support might be the wrong word might be a little bit harsh my children marrying white people which coming out of my mouth it sounds ridiculous i'm i'm aware of that but looking at the system looking at the inherited racism and ha- seeing how hard it was for me to break out of that system mentally but still being very much part of the system socially i don't want that for my kids i want them to be safe i want them to have children with people that can connect with them and their struggle, you know? And furthermore, I don't want the blackness to be diluted even more. I want my children to to have kids that look like them, that are happily going to go to Africa, that are going to, you know, carry on the power that my children hold because of where they come from, because of the resistance black people have shown in white societies, um, because of the greatness of Africa, it is what it is. Well, it might not be sitting right with everybody, but I literally don't care. <laughs> so um, looking at all these things, and Netflix is just one example. Another example, when Netflix brought out, last summer last year, I think, brought out their Black Lives Matter category, I read it on Facebook and I was excited. I was like, oh, yes, you know, I have something to show to my kids. I opened the category and the only thing I saw was um, movies like um, American Son, when they see us, 12 years a slave. Um, like I can't really name more than that because I didn't watch, I, I didn't pay attention to the category because to me, if you as a company want to show the world that black lives matter, wouldn't it be the first step to show the greatness of black people, their achievements, their resistance, their pride, their, their, um, their history before European invasion, their history before colonialism, their history before slavery, because those things are not African history. They are European history. Um, we look at the Holocaust as um, German history, right? We are being taught about this as German history because we Germans did that to Jewish people. So why are we turning these things around and calling slavery and colonialism African history? Meanwhile, the predators were Europeans. Why are we not calling it European history that was done to Africans using the same logic we are using for, on the Jewish Holocaust? Because by put, calling it African history, we are watering down African history socially, historically. Um, we are taking away the power from African history by labeling slavery and colonialism African history to let them know how weak Africans are to be able to be colonized and to be enslaved. But that's not the fact. If you know how slavery and colonialism came to be, you know that it was less a question of power and more a question of manipulation and um, of a fake superiority complex, of a fake picture of a white man as a savior that still very much holds power onto today. It was never about power when it comes to manpower or knowledge. That, it was never the case because Africans have ruled out white people in power, in achievements, in strength, in unity ever since they came to existence. So that level is not a level where we can in any way compete with Africans or with black people in general. So we couldn't get them on the power level. We couldn't get them on a knowledgeable level because they civilized the world when white people didn't even exist. So we had to turn the system upside down to get to the root of where we wanted to go. To be able to invade Africa, we had to form a whole system of oppression. We had to form a whole system of fake superiority to make it possible for us to invade an entire civilization, several civilizations, they were built and civilized and established before we even existed. And this manipulation very much holds on until today. So if we are being taught about all these things, and then if we are showing the world how great Africa is and how great black people are and what they have achieved, it automatically takes away the power of us as white people. Do we want that? Of course not. Because with power, with the lack of power and the loss of power comes the loss of our standards, of our um, economy, of our societies. It's like, it's like you're trying to hold water with your hands. It's, it doesn't have no power. It's not going to work, you know? So giving black people, giving is, is, is a little bit, it might not be the right word, but admitting, let me say admitting, um, the power and the, the achievements of black people automatically means we are putting ourselves, okay, like 
currently white people are here, right? Then we have like Asians, um, non, non black people, like Arabs, Middle Easterns. Then we have indigenous people. And then at the bottom, we have white people. That's the, how the system is built, right? I'm not saying that it's not my opinion. I'm saying this is the system. So us admitting the power and strength and knowledge and achievements black people have, um, have achieved during history, which also means we need to admit that black people didn't come to America during slavery only. I beg your pardon. Absolutely not. You know, uh, black people traveled all the way from America, from Africa to America long before Columbus even swam in his daddy's ball. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that admitting that means we are taking away our power of saying, oh, after all, we brought you to America. We brought you here. Okay. No, no. You kidnapped those people. You didn't bring anybody anywhere. You stole them from the motherland brought them across the ocean and dehumanized them for hundreds of years. You are a criminal. So by admitting all these things and admitting that black lives actually do not only matter, they are valuable, they are adored and treasured. It's going to twist things. Okay. We'll put black people here and white people here. And who in their right mind does want to be put at the bottom of the society? So white people are always going to do their very best to hold on to the false power we achieved by killing, invading, raping, murdering, oppressing, enslaving and colonializing the world. Um, and that I'm sitting here today telling you this is, is a result of hours, weeks, months of, of uh, black people not giving up on me in a nutshell. Uh, of, of a white woman seeing something in me that was worthy her time, um, of black people seeing something in me that was worthy their time of teaching me their ways, um, sharing their pain with me, um, uh, letting me see their reality of life, uh, teaching me what they feel like, you know, taking my hand and showing me how the world truly is. Um, and these are things I don't want to call names because I don't know if the people are going to be comfortable with this. But if you see this video and you know that you've contributed to my growth, um, I'm deeply grateful. I'm more than grateful. This is, I couldn't be, I mean, to say it as it is, I couldn't be the mother, wife and sister to people I am today, auntie, friend, if not for people that didn't give up, give up on me, if not for people that didn't give up. Um, and saw something in me that was worthy, their teachings uh, were worthy, their time, um, their anger, because God knows I'm a pain in the ass. I'm so sorry, but I was not an easy student. I was not, because I was so in that bubble of white privilege. I was so into, oh no, racism is something that only bad people have. It took me years to realize that I am also racist, simply because I benefit from the system of oppression. Um, every day when I open TikTok, when I open uh, Facebook, when I open Instagram, there are amazing black people that never get tired of teaching me. You know, that there are amazing black people I know I can always turn to, always ask them questions um, and continue growing because growth is forever it does never it does never stop it stop it stops the moment you die and if you do everything right your name is going to even overlive or outlive your physical appearance and the only I, I mean sometimes people ask me what's your intention well i don't really have an intention in a way of um well actually my intention is to change the world but uh, <laughs> I know that's not possible, uh, but I also know that every time a white person talks, another white person listens. Um, I've realized in, in all these years that this is a very painful process, but it's nothing compared to the pain black people face on a daily basis. So I'm no longer going to coddle white people's feelings or my own white feelings. Um, I'm, we are, we've crossed the time of uh, giving room to white fertility in our societies where white people get to ask, what can I do? Get your ass up and do your research. Stop being ignorant. Stop asking black people what you can do. 
find out by yourself. None of us will go to school and ask the teacher, okay, uh, what can I do? Every teacher will be like, um, you know the topic is German grammar. Get your book up and read. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But once we grow, we turn to black people and we are like, um, how can I help you? Black people don't need our help. I don't know why this white savior complex is so inherited in us. It's so disgusting. Every time I see somebody asking white uh, black people, what can we do to help you? Don't help them. Help yourself. Because we are the problem. Black people are not the problem. They are not the ones that oppress the world. That they are in the position of the victim doesn't give you the right to go and continuously re-traumatize them with your ignorance and your racism. Google is literally free. I mean, excuse me. This is, there is no room for that anymore. We've, we've crossed this time. Like, we've already, like, so we are so late. Like, we are so late to the party. I can't even, like, had it been we, we had this argument, like, 500 years ago, the system wouldn't be the way it is. But we've, be, we've decided to be cowards, you know. We've be, decided to be cowards, be quiet, and let all these things happen. Just like we let the Jewish Holocaust happen. This is how we allowed uh, white people to colonize the world. And had it been we stepped up as a collective society and said this is wrong, there needs to be a way for us to have a standard without exploiting the rest of the world and labeling, labeling Africa a third world country. Meanwhile, every life, every resources, every, every breath of air comes from there, you know? So it took me years. It took me years and it's still taking me time to realize things and realize and understand every layer of society, every layer of racism, every depth and every, every color of racism, every... Racism isn't just a white person calling a black person the N-word. That's the least problem of racism. And that's already bad. So if you get to understand racism, you know that a word is the least problem of racism we have. Because if we can, if I was to choose um, society, let me change society and let racism totally be erased, which means white, prim white privilege and white supremacy would no longer be a thing, but therefore let the N-word be in existence. I would not, I'm not in a position to decide that because I am not a victim of the N-word, but black people would have a lot more peace and freedom if the system wasn't the way it is, but the N-word still existed. So the words has a huge power because of what we did. But the word is the least problem when it comes to the depth and layers and importance of racism and the crimes we committed for that word to even have the power it has. So the word is like the tip of the iceberg, right? It's like up here, but racism is all the rest of the iceberg until all the way down to the ocean. So if you cut the tip of the iceberg off, you still have the iceberg that is still going to sink a ship. You've not achieved shit. So even if we get to a point whereby we are not going to because white people are ignorant brats. When I see TikTok and YouTube and the way white people so desperately want to say the N-word, then I know that we've not achieved anything. But if you go and cut the tip of the iceberg off and you get white people to stop calling the N-word, nothing has changed because the system is still fucked up. You know, the system is still built on racism, enabled by racism, flourishing on racism. Um, we need to dismantle every single layer of the system, every single layer. And the first layer is history. Now, unfortunately, you can't undo history anymore. You never can because it's in the past. But we need to rewrite history and give that power we falsely held for the last 600 years back to the people they deserve it. We need to put black people back on the throne they, sa they sat on before we came into existence. So this is the first layer of dismantling the system. And it starts with literally, like if you really want to do something, you take the whole system and do it like this, you know? So bring a new piece of paper and rewrite the system because that's literally the only solution. Because if you change the system, the roots of it is still going to be racist. So that being said, uh, no, I'm not one of the good white people. <laughs> I'm not uh, different. I am not worth your praises. Um, no white person is. I'm not an ally. I've said that before. Um, I simply came to realize the truth because black people didn't give up on me. Because a white woman didn't give up on me. 
um, because I was ready to listen. But that doesn't make me different. That makes me a decent human being. So we need, like, the bar for white people is literally on the floor. I mean, if you're black and you're watching this, I want you to hold your um, expectations towards white people and your standards towards white people. I want it to skyrocket through the roof to an extent whereby you see every white person as a potential racist until they've proven to you that you can trust them. And even at that, still be careful. Because if both of you are going to be stopped, they are less likely to be done, to be killed. That's not their fault. Don't get me wrong. It's not my fault, but it's their fault of how they use that privilege and how they use their whiteness in society. If they distance themselves from their whiteness and they're like, oh, this white person is bad and this white person is good, they are the problem. Uh, so that being said, I hope this answers the question. I'm sorry that this video took so long. It's a very sensitive topic. And um, as I said before, uh, I'm very deeply grateful for the people in my life, the black people in my life, my family, my husband, um, my friends that never fail to check on me, uh, never fail to check me <laughs> and uh, correct me. Um, I'm also grateful for the white people that turn to me and they're like, if I do this and do that and do this and do that, don't stop asking. I'm not saying you should stop asking. I'm saying you should stop asking black people because it's never a black person's responsibility to teach us about our own crimes. Um, I want us as a society to come together and make racism a crime. Um, I'm not going to say make racism wrong again because it has never been wrong. Uh, it has very much always been right and, and, and a, enabled by white people. I want us as a society to collectively come together globally and make racism a crime, which means to convict ourselves. I want us to light our life down to be anti-racist by all means necessary to cut it short.